Introducing our second speaker, um, Deborah R. Vargas is Associate Professor in the Department of Ethnic Studies at the University of California, Riverside. Her first book, Dissonant Divas in Chicana Music, published in 2012 by the University of Minnesota Press, was awarded the Woody Guthrie Prize for Best Book on Popular Music Studies by the International Association for the Study of Popular Music, Best Book in Chicano Studies by the National Association for Chicana and Chicano Studies, an honorable mention for Best Book in La Latino Studies from the Latin American Studies Association. Her publications have appeared in journals including Atzlan, Journal for Chicano Studies, Women in Performance, Women in Music, and American Quarterly. One of her current manuscripts in progress is titled Brown Soul and draws on queer of color critique to explore the meaning of soul music's aesthetics and cultural politics, blackness and brownness in Mexican Chicano borderlands music in performances ranging from the Corrido de Carmen Amelia Robles to the music of Sheila E. and the 1980s duets of Linda Ronstadt and Aaron Neville. And her title today is Racing Queer Music, The J and Jenny, Jenny Rivera's Racing of Queer Music. Thank you, Susan. Um, it's always so hard to follow such a smart, thought-provoking presentation. So thank you for I'm all like, thank you for that, like, for setting me up that way. I'm just kidding. Uh, now, nah, so, so uh, hopefully this does justice to following up Professor Jones's great presentation. Um, I also wanted to follow up on Professor Jones's uh, thanks to everyone. Uh, it takes a lot of unseen labor to put these kinds of gatherings together. So I really appreciate Hetty, Emily, and everyone else who just gave their time to bring us all together today. Um, and thank you so much to Professor Cusick for being moderator. It's really such an honor to have you read our work, to engage it, and to um, just be here with us, uh, to have us share our, our thoughts about music and race and queerness. Um, so I'll begin. Mexican banda and ranchera singer Jenny Rivera once tweeted to her, out to her fan club, the J unit, dear J unit, when I die, remember to please make sure I am buried upside down so the haters can continue to kiss my ass. <laughs> Love, Jenny. So statements like this are but one example of Rivera's brash, in-your-face, loudmouth performances of disreputable Mexicana femininity that often garnered her the reference as una mujerona, the Mexican-Spanish vernacular for a big, audacious, and brazen woman. Rivera, whose irreverent popular cultural representation was shaped as much by themes in her hit songs about shameless women, is by her per personal life dramas, including fights with record industry people, family members, and ex-husbands, um, I contend offers us much to think about in terms of racialized sexuality, Latinidad, and gender in relation to the conference theme addressing racing um, queer music. When I consider Kathy Cohen's notion of queer as, uh, and these are Kathy Cohen's um, words, as the maintenance of radical potential located in an ability to create a space in opposition to dominant norms, a space where transformational politics can begin, Jenny Rivera's cultural labor f represents this kind of transformational p potential for exploring race and queer musical performance, especially given the context of neoliberal logics of US anti-immigrant racist discourses that too often reproduce equally troubling reaffirmations of normative Latina gender and sexuality. As Jenny Rivera's popular iconic power increased throughout her music career, especially among Mexicanas and Chicanas residing in the United States and Northern Mexico, her performance of Latina gender and sexuality became more unabashed and discourteous of boundaries of feminine normativity. Following uh, the notion of queer as an opposition to normativity or non-normative gender and sexuality, I consider the letter J in Jenny's name as signifying queer world making within broader Mexicano Latino public culture. Um, in fact, Rivera's largest and most powerful fan club, the J unit that I just referenced uh, a minute ago, um, always pronounced uh, the name of their group in Spanish as J unit, um, because the letter J in Spanish is pronounced J. 
the word jota also happens to be a Mexican Spanish vernacular for queer. So my analysis of Jenny Rivera's racing of queer music then understands the J in Jenny to symbolize in the spirit of Cohen's queer, Cohen and other queer of color um, critique scholars, um, the possibilities of opposition to neoliberal Latina citizenship performed by constructions of normative gender and sexuality. In other words, I read the J in J unit and in Jenny as the Jota in Jenny. That is, I argue that the Jota in Jenny Rivera's musical performance represents a critical music archive that activates everyday possibilities of sonic disobedience to normative Latinidad. Calling out the Jota in Jenny aims to critique the limits of respectability discourses as discursive strategies for contesting Latina racism, anti-immigrant xenophobia, and structural disenfranchisement. I understand Latina respectability to be performed as normative constructions of femininity shaped by racialized class privilege behavior and aesthetics of appropriateness, dignity, and civility, or what it means when Mexicanos reference una mujer decente, a decent, respectable woman. Uh, furthermore, I reflect on Latina respectability politics as functioning both within a kind of cultural policing of difference by one's own affiliated community. So, for example, the way in which homophobia and racism um, operates within Latino communities, Chicano communities, right? To kind of set boundaries of uh, normative notions of family is one example. Uh, and also by the state, such that diversity in terms of race, gender, and sexuality are assimilated into dominant normative notions of multicultural citizenship, right? So the legibility now of um, you know, queer relationships, or we can say same-sex relationships, is now only being legible or validated through the institution of marriage. Right? So with that said, um, Latina respectability politics is approached here through white supremacist discourses of U.S. citizenship and contextualized within anti-immigrant uh, racist xenophobia. Um, and a great uh, example of this tension, right, in the production of, of Latina femininity in, in broader public culture um, that we can point to as a kind of like setting up this, this, this tension, right, that I think Rivera's um, music gets at uh, is, the, uh, is the construction of the dreamer um, citizen, right, the development, relief, and education for alien minors, very briefly, um, just the, the uh, resolution that's moving through uh, Congress and the Senate, right, that will allow uh, minors, those who came over with parents at a very young age, were born here at a very young age, um, who are now seeking uh, temporary uh, residency. But part of that move from temporary to permanent residency is to exhibit moral character, right? Either through the service or through um, uh, a higher education degree, right? Um, so, um, and so a lot of the slogans and visual culture campaigns of the Dreamer, right, ca um, campaigns, many of them, most of them actually um, high school and college age students, uh, perform brown subjectivities that, that work to transform a kind of alien representation into diversity citizens, right? And much of this, of course, predictably relies on heteronormative constructions of gender, of family, of community, uh, that are reinforced by representations of, of nameless laboring brown bodies, or the good Latino consumer citizen. Queer of color analysis of, of gender and sexuality in popular culture is, is, is key, right, given um, past decades of anti-immigrant racism in the U.S., especially targeting Mexican and Central Americans, right? So, for example, we only need to recall the kind of recent um, uh, event at the U.S.-Mexican border when a, um, a great number of, of, of young Central American children were being dropped off or had been bused, right, from um, uh, the internal parts of Mexico by parents uh, and who arrived here. And a lot of the discourse around these children, right, were, um, you know, very much along the lines of children who were from dysfunctional mothers. How could mothers actually leave their kids uh, as um, disease uh, ridden, as dangerous, right? They really threatened this kind of reproduction of a normative U.S. child citizen. And so the performance of who deserves to be treated as human, as normal, as potential citizen then not only relies on normative notions of Latina femininity, femininity, but also these kind of racist logics that serve to justify the disappearance, be it through death or through gentrification, um, of those represented as threats to upholding liberal middle class ideologies of Latinidad. And these are, you know, namely the poor, 
darker queer genders. Um, it, and it's with such discourses in mind that, that I read the Jota and Jenny Rivera as, as sounding um, these other kinds of like supposed threat subject to, su subjects, right? The brown, welfare, femme, immigrant, transgender, queer worlds um, of Latinidad. Even in her posthumous state, Jenny Rivera leaves um, queer music scholars with, with much to explore about queer cultural politics and racialized sexualities, including how um, Jota Latina femininities threatened the reproduction of this neoliberal Latina um, respectability. Right? That is, the Jota and Jenny uh, created, and I think still does create, sonic imaginaries for and with questionable, uncontainable, supposed pathological gendered acts that represent a kind of crisis for affirming the sexual desires and labor exploitations that affirm white supremacy. And so today I wanna uh, focus on one text uh, from Jenny v Rivera's musical archive um, to exemplify how um, she initiated a performance of Latina queer gender and sexuality um, in the form of audacious disobedience to this kind of project of this neoliberal Latina respectability. Um, namely, Rivera's performance of La Malandrina, um, the song, um, the video that I'm going to actually show in a little bit. Um, of, and La Malandrina is this vernacular reference, right, to party girls, bad girls, up to no good girls. Uh, and specifically, I want to reflect on how performances of Rivera's Malandrina. Um, in the song recording itself, the lyrics, um, Jenny's, uh, you know, um, performance of it in concerts, I don't have a a, you know, time to go through all of these examples. I want to feature just one. Um, the music video, right, representation of the figure, and also the self-references of the term that were taken up by young Latinas to name a lot of social clubs, right? Facebook pages, Twitter accounts, um, social clubs and communities, et cetera, right? Uh, and that animate these ki this kind of denial and active failure and disobedience um, to sort of negating this kind of neoliberal Latina citizenship project um, based on this politics of, of respectability. Um, so with that said, um, Rivera's Malandrinas must be understood within this context of structural mechanisms aimed at the elimination, displacement, disappearance, and sanitization of brown, poor, undocumented welfare subjects, especially feminine genders that range from the undocumented Mexican and Central American mothers who cross the U.S.-Mexico border to clean up after all of us, um, the, pri the privileged, and, and who, who, who care for the children, right, of, of middle-class privileged um, citizens. Um, but also, that also include the transvesti and transgender Latinas working the queer nightclub during Latin night. Um, in pondering the figure of La Malandrina, I, I find productive Roderick Ferguson's queer of color critique uh, that the contradictions of capital, um, he argues, give rise to the polymorphous perversions that arise out of the production of labor. Um, thus, my consideration of Rivera's musical performance of La Malandrina operates in conversation with at least three racialized discourses of structural difference, right, that pertain to non-normative genders and sexualities. One, as, as the lewd, obscene, offensive, hypersexual, undisciplined body. Uh, two, as the darkened, suspect citizen, perpetually unworthy, impure, and disloyal to the state. And three, as diseased, uh, culture of poverty subjects. Uh, already always overdetermined to fail to evolving into normative womanhood. Jenny DeVetta's music musical performance, as in her life script, consistently failed at fulfilling a Latina politics of respectable citizen subject. Um, and before discussing, uh, doing a little bit of a, you know, bit more of a closer reading of, of, of the song La Malandrina, and just the general performance of this really this figure that took on a, a life of its own as, 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 as uh, Rivera's career became more powerful. Um, I want to include, uh, you know, some biographical details about Jenny Rivera's life, um, sometimes because depending on, on you know, uh, region or in this case uh, a non-U.S. context, um, uh, people may have heard Jenny's name or may have heard a little bit about her music or maybe none at all, uh, but her bi biography is, is really, really um, critical, right, to the analysis of her music. Um, and I think uh, it really uh, comes to shape a lot of her uh, gender performance, right, and very much shaped by structural and cultural realities of her life. Um, if there was ever one 
consistent characteristic about Jenny. It was that she embodied the irreverent femininity of Chus Maria. And, and Chus Maria is something that Jose Munoz uh, uh, talks at length about in disidentifications, right? It's this kind of defined behavior that refuses the standards of bourgeois comportment and becomes a mode for articulating, he argues, um, queer worlds or queer world, queer world making. And Jenny's Chus Maria was demonstrated um, often by her kind of outlandish and disparaging public stagings of her personal life in the media, as well as confrontations with co um, concert audience members uh, that she felt disrespected by, right? And haters was one of her favorite words. You know, she always was um, uh, confronting the haters, right? People who, you know, uh, basically disrespected um, a sense of empowerment or, uh, or power, right, on her part. Um, and so there was a consistent sort of disobeying of the systems of suitable behavioral pro protocol that, that really are expected and I think, um, you know, that uh, are pressure filled, right, for Latina celebrities um, generally, but in the music industry especially, very little room to move outside of that for women of color in general performers. Um, so Jenny Rivera, just to give you some, some bit of her background, um, uh, was born on, in 1969 in Long Beach, uh, California. Actually, uh, Huntington Park moved to, grew up in Long Beach, California. And she was the eldest of six children uh, to Pedro and Rosa, who were undocumented immigrants from Sonora and Jalisco, Mexico. Um, Jenny was regional Mexican music industry's diva de la banda, right, um, at the time of her passing. And, and anyone who knows anything about banda music knows how, uh, how much of a powerful kind of like, you know, sonic, um, you, know, it, you know, entity, right, like it is um, in, in parts of um, the United States uh, with high, you know, high numbers of immigrant population. Um, and at the time of her passing in December of 2012, uh, she was arguably one of the most powerful music icons uh, in Mexican banda, in narco corrido music, and in ranchera music. Um, and just as an example, um, you know, she, she appeared on her very own reality TV show. This is how, in, in many ways, the music industry was recognizing, right, how powerful of a musical icon she was, right? Um, she had a huge fan following, and so the reality show became one example. She was also tapped to be a judge on the Mexican equivalent of The Voice, La Voz, right? Um, and she was adored by her fans, and, and she had an especially strong fan base among Chicanas and Mexicana immigrants um, residing in the U.S. And then they it seemed especially drawn, right, to Rivera's way of aggressively dealing with challenges in her life. Rivera rarely had a filter when it came to putting issues she cared about on blast, um, including calling out domestic abuse, homophobia, uh, and anti-immigrant racism. She did this consistently in, in interviews and on her, on her website. Um, she never abided by the rules of decency, right, point blank. Rather, she seemed to approach her life's work in the manner she worked her life, churning out, cranking out, and calling out in ways that testify to the relentlessness of a certain kind of Latina working class immigrant tenacity. Uh, we might say that this was because Jenny never had anything to lose. She was born in structural deficit. From a young age, she learned to survive through self-made ventures in the informal economy uh, that at one point helped her and her daughter escape an abusive hu husband. It makes sense to me then that Rivera never found much safety or support in coloring her life by staying inside the lines of respectability. She often commented in interviews that her big mouth came from the fact that, as she once stated in an interview, silence never saved me. She grew up in a working class bilingual immigrant barrio of Long Beach, uh, about half hour outside of Los Angeles. Um, and her family was part of this large Mexicano immigrant presence that started to grow right in the 1980s in Long Beach. And that was really sonically convened through banda music. I mean, banda music became really the sound, right, of the, the influx of Mexicano immigrants to certain parts of Southern California, Chicago, right, uh, New York, other parts of the East Coast. Um, so there is, I think, an important interconnectedness between Jenny's lived experiences growing up in a Mexicano immigrant musical milieu that propelled banda music in broader Los Angeles, 
Um, and in many ways, right, uh, it's why oftentimes people say Los Angeles has never not been imagined through Mexican musical sound, right? Um, and her eventual title as La Diva de la Banda. Um, but it's also worth noting that although Jenny recognized her singing abilities around the age of 14, she consistently stated in interviews that she really had no interest in making music, right? Her goal, rather, was to be economically independent. And music uh, merely became an accessible avenue for accomplishing this. And so we could talk a little bit further about what that actually means in terms of her, you know, lack, you know, so-called lack of musical training, but also why I think she approached um, her kind of um, icon, icon status in a particular way, right? In some ways, she wasn't as invested um, in obtaining right, the accolades or the validation from, from the music industry. Um, it was this kind of entrepreneurial approach to her music career that is why many of her fans consistently commented that part of their adoration for Jenny was that she had lived a lot of what they had experienced, right? What we might refer to as a kind of immigrant class epistemology of survival and persistence. Jenny's tactics for survival began at a young age. Um, you know, during her sophomore year in high school, uh, she became romantically involved with a much older man. Uh, she ended up uh, giving birth to her first child uh, with him. Uh, and when she was uh, when she became pregnant, her parents kicked her out of her home. So she became totally dependent on this older man. And this, this sort of eight-year marriage between them really resulted in a, in a power dynamic, right? Uh, ob an obvious one, and one filled with emotional and physical abuse, uh, including two suicide attempts by, by Jenny, um, until she finally gained enough courage to, to seek a divorce. And much of this was um, due to her... Uh, working to, to gain economic independence from him. Uh, this early relationship would leave the traces of physical and emotional abuse that uh, would frame much of Jenny's life in music and her eventual advocacy for bringing attention to domestic abuse. Um, as such, Jenny made music the ways she approached economic survival through the cultivation of life lessons that framed her life, equipped with savvy labor skills, having been raised um, in an immigrant entrepreneurial community where, as a young mother, she did everything from collect cans uh, to sell at recycling centers to hawking knockoff cassettes uh, and uh, VHS uh, recordings of, uh, of music video recordings at her family's flea market. Uh, stand. One of her earliest experiences in, in music's informal economy was with her father Pedro, who after spending the majority of his life working odd jobs, realized it was a niche for selling self-produced pirated recordings of corridos, right? So Pedro Rivera um, also wrote corridos himself. Um, he re-recorded, you know, pirated um, cassettes that were already out there, and he also created kind of a makeshift studio and recorded many corridos himself, and also had sometimes neighbors who, who could sing, right, record some of them, and he sold thousands of these cassettes at, at his flea market. Um, and eventually he would start his own recording company that really became uh, the backbone of, of support for both Jenny and also other family members who ended up um, singing um, as well. Um, he would start this uh, company, Cintas Aquario, um, who you'll see in a second, who actually was the producer of Jenny's uh, uh, music video. Um, and it, it operated out of a Long, Long Beach storefront, right? It was very much a mom and pop shop that, that really served as Jenny's earliest entrance uh, into music, where she organized paperwork, answered phones, kept the counting records. Um, and so her initial engagement with music um, wasn't this kind of formal cultural art education or any kind of training or any, even any sort of like, you know, what oftentimes singers can sort of say, well, I grew up in a singing family, right, that really taught me uh, a voice, et cetera. Um, none of that was really um, the issue. You know, music really was this kind of entrepreneurial kind of self-making uh, venture, right, for her family. Um, who happened, you know, some of them happened to know how to sing, right? Um, so her initial engagement, um, uh, you know, was more really symbolized through this kind of Mexican vernacular for work. Uh, this kind of term chamba that a lot of uh, Mexicano immigrants use or phrases like necesito jale, right? I need a job, quiero chambiar, I want to work. Uh, so the chamba, um, jale, right, tends to kind of signify this kind of creative labor force, right? That, that really comes from knowing the precarity of job insecurity on the daily, right? Where the only guarantee is this kind of burden of persistent effort that you have to have every day, right, from the moment that you wake up. Um, so, in fact, then in a statement describing Jenny, right, this kind of is the point about her vocals or her sort of, you know, training as a singer, how she arrived to music. 
Um, Agustin Gursa, um, a journalist, uh, described her uh, as more of a social singer than an artist, right? Um, Jenny's musical performances cultivated, um, you know, a kind of more m a, a musicking of, of testimonial, is what I call a kind of musicking of testimonial. Really creating music that was intertwined by the kind of chorus of gossip around her personal life, these kind of outlandish behaviors, um, these public enactments of, ch of Chus Maria, right? That actively really placed her icon status as, a, you know, as the public face of, of social justice issues. Um, Los Angeles music journalist Fernando Gonzalez um, also say that the Jenny's secret to her fame was not that she had um, such an out outstanding gifted voice, right, because she didn't, in his opinion. It was really that she poured her life into her songs uh, with all of her faults, downfalls, and tragedies. Um, these are his words, including a teen pregnancy and domestic abuse. Um, he goes on to say the fans made her a star because they saw themselves reflected in her. Um, over the course of her career, um, just as a few examples, right, she, be, she would become the spokesperson uh, for the National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. Uh, she often made statements uh, around abuse of LGBTQ communities. Uh, and through uh, the Jenny, Lo Jenny Rivera Love Foundation, right, this foundation that she founded, she offered social services, right, where she, you could mail her at some point when the inter internet became more accessible. Uh, could fill out a form on the internet uh, that was specifically targeted to undocumented immigrant women, right? You know, like her parents, right, who needed assistance of, of some kind, some sort of material resource assistance. Um, she was the first um, among only a few major Latina ce celebrities, right, to call out um, Arizona's State Senate Bill SB 1070, right, um, racist, and she used that term, and I, and I have to stress this, right, because the term racism and racist is something that everyone avoids, right, you must rather talk about discrimination or, you know, bullying or what have you, right, but, but not those terms, and she consistently always referred to, to that bill as racist, and uh, I'm, in, I could say more about SB 1070, but basically it was really considered the most, um, you know, anti-immigrant, policy, right, in recent um, U.S. Um, immigrant, immigration history, right, it's really uh, one of the most hateful um, legislations and that really um, transferred uh, any kind of policing power of, around uh, undocumented immigration to local police and really resulted in, in, um, in uh, uh, um, targeting, right, and ra racial profiling, really, around the state. And, but it was really much more as much as it, it had a sort of everyday impact, it was just much more symbolic, right, when SB 1070 was sort of circulating um, in its as eventual passage, right? Um, so she was one of really a few kind of Latino celebrities that really kind of came out against it. Uh, but she was really the one that uh, showed up when it came time for very big public events like this big rally that happened in Phoenix in 2010. Um, and, you know, she released a press release that announced that she was going to go there. She wanted everyone, uh, all media, to, to follow her basically there, right? Um, to the march, uh, and so she, she called it a very hateful, um, you know, uh, uh, law and on her press statement. And uh, I just want to show you a very brief kind of um, clip, right, very short, just a few seconds of her there um, at the rally. This is after a sort of like post-march concert that took place that she was going to perform at among other kind of local uh, bands and musicians. But it's also after she had marched six miles with protesters, right? Uh, this was very kind of rare. Here today. Jenny, we got to ask you today because of all of you. What this law is trying to do is not only separate families, but they're still trying to discriminate, to single us out. They're haters, baby. They're trying to single us out. They're trying to single us out. It's discrimination, it's racism, it's hatred. <laughs> we are not supposed to be living this at this moment. Okay. So in the 1990s, um, Banda music's popularity had the full attention of um, Spanish language radio that boomed, right? Um, in the 80s and 90s, um, and also the attention of major music recording companies. Uh, so all of this is sort of context now for, for moving to the mid-1990s and, and Jenny Rivera's arrival. 
Um, in 95, 1995, Jenny would gain entry into the formal music industry, right, because she's been part of the informal uh, economy of the music industry for, uh, you know, for a while. Um, she was contracted to release her first album titled La Chacalosa, right, It included her hit Corrido by the same name. And La Chacalosa is basically a narrative about the daughter of a narcotraficante who makes his li uh, her living off of um, drug transactions, right? So it's, we can also talk about the whole genre of narco corridos and, and the kind of gender politics about that. But yet, you know, a lot of the um, women ranchera singers who, you know, record these, these particular kinds of songs, right? It also connects to, to, to the performances of gender that you'll see and sexuality in the video. Um, so one of the, uh, Jenny's biggest hit songs in, in these early years that really remained so throughout her life was La Malandrina, right? La Malandrinas. And this song actually really became Rivera's uh, first music video that she coped co-produced, right? Um, and in fact, uh, the young women that, that you'll see are actually uh, show up with, you know, Jenny makes a call to fans to show up. She doesn't want to hire actors. Um, also, you'll see, and I'll remind you, it's a very grainy, low-budget produced video, right? And some of this is because at that point, you know, it wasn't about making music videos that would circulate on um, Spanish language television, right, as much as y you would record these and put them on VHS and sell them, right, in your neighborhood or at flea markets, right? So um, the greatness is partly because this has been uh, played so many times, but it's also because it was very low grade to begin with as a production, right? Uh, but you'll see that uh, the young women, um, these are actually real fans, and at one point, like, she even talks about the importance of, of having these um, young women show up. Um, so she, she described uh, once in an interview, um, las malandrinas, she says, means bad girls, party girls, but not in a negative way. Right? She says, I wrote it in homage to my female fans, the type of girls that go clubbing, drink lots of tequila, and who stand up for themselves. That song is when Jenny Rivera, the artist, was actually born. Those are her words, right? Um, and, and, and the song and the music video, right, became so popular that um, she would often call to out to her fans during her concerts. This is what she would do. She would hail them. She would say, ¿Dónde están mis malandrinas? And all, you know, a lot of the women, maybe not all of them, would sort of like call out to her as sort of like we're here, right? So it became this kind of, um, you know, kind of sonic sort of like assembly, right, of like these sort of bad girls, party girls um, at, at concerts. Um, many of them adopted that name, like I said. Uh, put it on license plates, you'll see the car in the video has the name of Malandrinas. That's, that's real, that's not, that's not there for uh, the video, it's actually a real license plate. Um, and a number of different other examples that, that we can talk about. Um, in the song and by extension the music video, Las Malandrinas are the embodiment of overabundance, of promiscuity, of surplus indulgence. The song and music video um, propelled these countless numbers of virtual social worlds initiated by fans uh, and numerous like Facebook pages including Las Malandrinas de Jenny Rivera, a group that described themselves as un grupo de amigas que nos gusta andar de party, right? A, a group of girls who love to party. Um, there are also uh, eventual uh, YouTube videos, right, of young women uh, singing the song themselves, sort of performing the characters in the song, right, that begin to circulate. Um, the most powerful fan social group, again, was JUnit that I mentioned. Um, Jota unit, right? Na drew on the narco corrido vernacular. Um, Jenny described them as mi propio cartel, right? Uh, and this really described the, the function as uh, she would say, you know, Jota unit, um, you know, their, their work is haciendo un gran, un gran desmadre positivo, right? Which is in, in English saying, you know, their, their work is really to create a cha chaotic um, or the you know, chaotic disorder of positivity, right, of good, of good work, right? Um, but so there's something about this desmadre and the chaos and the kind of um, countering, right, of normativity that it's very interesting. Um, and in fact, when, when, when Jenny Rivera passed away in 2012, the family actually directed the media to the, the Jota unit website, right, and to, to their Twitter to give all the information. This is how powerful of a group these young women were. Um, to give all details about her memorial and, and just to respond to any questions about her life and biography, right? Just an example. Um, the following um, music video, La Malandinas, right? It was produced uh, just after the 1999 um, song release. And it opens with the lyrics, um, and here I'll translate into English, right? They call us Las Malandrinas because we make lots of noise, because we drink beer, and prefer the best wine. Um, the, the song was written by Jenny and, and like I said, was produced by her family's uh, 
uh, company, Cintas Acuario. Um, and, and this is why you also see references in the song and in the video to her brother, um, Juan, right, and Lupillo. Uh, who, who eventually have their own careers because after all it's it's a family venture right you also have to kind of promote the rest of your family in the in the music business um, I'll say a, a bit more about the lyrics or I'm happy to translate you can sort of you almost don't even need to understand what's going on in the in the you know in the um, in the lyrics to you know because it's all really performed in front of you right so the video um, begins with the camera panning out from this uh, marijuana leaf tattoo arm of a young Latina who, along with her friends, right, uh, they're in this record store and they're stealing cassettes, right, off the rack. Um, remember cassettes? Wow. <laughs> uh, and greeting each other with a kind of customary homegirl acknowledgement. Hey, what's up? Right? The group of Latinas is, juxt is juxtaposed with another group of Latinas um, who are actually at the counter talking to the salesperson um, who, are, who are referred to in the song, right? They come to represent Las Popis in the actual like lyrics of the song and Las Popis is a kind of Mexican vernacular for middle class proper snobbish young women right they're standing at the counter asking the cashier if he has any cassettes by Mexican pop crooner Luis Miguel right so if you know anything it's sort of like a course countering right Luis Miguel uh, the cashier responds no but I do have Juan and Jenny Rivera right uh, and the young women he shows them some posters the young women express their dissatisfaction I say no nah, we don't like that right um, so it'll go on I won't I won't say anything more but I'm happy to translate any lyrics um, or anything from the video. But let me let the video run, and I want to say a few things about it. Uh, and this is a typical banda, banda song, by the way. No encontré posters de Luis Miguel ni de Thalía, pero tengo de Juan y Jenny Rivera. Well, obviously that to do that I with the hat on. Uh, 
Um, there's also it, some class uh, references and critique in the song. For example, they, you know, she makes a reference in one of the lyrics about, uh, you know, we're not like uh, middle class bourgeois, you know, women who are afraid of, you know, afraid of things. We're not, we're not afraid. Malandinas aren't afraid, right? Uh, we're not scared, right? Um, little girls. Um, the song and, and music video Las Malandrinas convene an assembly of disreputable and uncivil femininities, or in the terms of queer of color critique of the deviant among citizens, uh, here performed by brown women consuming excessive amounts of alcohol, uh, what I read as same-sex S&M play, and, and the unproductive labor of kicking it and hanging out. With the, within the context of xenophobic racism, especially directed um, since the 1990s at Mexican and Central American immigrants in the U.S., R Rivera's Malandinas create una desmadre, or chaotic disorder, to the production of Latina respectability uh, required in a reaffirming a normative Latino citizen subject. In fact, Rivera's Malandrinas encourage brown feminine presenting genders to act out an alternative sociality, mocking the capitalist fictions of rewards for good behavior promised by the state. To be sure, Malandrinas are no dreamer citizen. Rather, they are the brown, unproductive, surplus femininities whose resilience requires ground, grinding out the day by also learning when to lag behind productive time and to act over the top because capitalist temporality is cons constantly trying to disappear their traces. The desmadre imagined in Rivera's Las Malandrinas activate performances of Latina femininity that fail to fulfill the expectations of the respectable gender and sexual politics of Latinidad. Moreover, I believe that Las Malandrinas names a brown queer iconography of femmes welfare queens, transvesti, and transgender Latinas that encourage critical contemplation of normalizing discourses of Latino citizenship figured through the conjoining calls by liberal LGBTQ campaigns for marriage equality and also by Latino immigration reform platforms organized mostly through the hetero homonormative trope of family. Every time Jenny asked her fans, ¿Dónde están mis malandrinas? She summoned those homosocial kinships of nasty girls, partiers, and troublemakers that on the one hand are often viewed, according to racist U.S. discourses, as specters of the mass onslaught of brown bodies that create anxieties over social welfare drains and criminality, and yet in their performances as racialized, irreverent brown spectacles also transmit sonic socialities of alternative praxis for creating other modes of collective play and fruitless downtime through bodily pleasure um, counter, that counter right, the disposable, tireless servants of, the, of brown labor, right? this sort of like um, uh, deferential, right? always ready to work brown labor. Um, that neoliberal capital citizenship um, constantly works to both restrain and suppress. Following my analytic of the Jota and Jenny, I understand the performance of Las Malandinas as a queer testimonial that brown queers know quite well the broken promises of the state to reward good and appropriate citizens. Uh, for example, the taxpaying citizen, the soldier, the one who stands for the national anthem, the homeowner, the parent consumer, right? If we perform all these, uh, you know, um, we'll end up being rewarded, right? Um, this is because when brown folk uh, uh, you know, have, have historically abided by a politics of respectability, it has not saved them. Uh, it has not saved the working class queer, queers from debt, the immigrants from, from an inhumane health care system, or the 50% of high school dropouts from a defective public education. Right? In this way, I suggest that Las Malandrinas illuminate the racist contradictions of U.S. Latino citizenship discourses of civility that thrive on the simultaneous necessity of and disposability of brown feminine bodies. The malandrina thereby becomes the embodiment of indiscretion and excretion of wasteful byproducts, as in the waste or deficit of capitalist productive time, within a racist xenophobic world where Latina gender and sexuality is under constant surveillance and regulation, and yet a persistent desire to be extracted for productivity. In other words, Las Malandrinas pri pri prioritize the life of surplus, right? Going back to Roderick Ferguson's quote, 
um, the life of surplus, drinking time, brutal party time, kicking it time. They lay claim to all of the capital's leftovers in the form of promiscuous sexual relations, temporalities of debt, and transient notions of home. As such, these representations of Latina gender and sexuality function as performative critiques of spatial temporal modalities of separation and alienation that US citizenship thrives on, such as borders, domestic privacy, and individual acquisition of wealth. Rather, malandrinas activate public indiscretions, valueless labor, and queer foreplay, prompting other socialities and kinships based on, alter on alternative currencies. In the music industry, there is enormous pressure for women of color singing icons to steer away from scandal, rumors, or the publicity of bad behavior that might tarnish their performative womanhood. Jenny Rivera turned the performance of Latina respectability on its head. In Jenny, uh, and through her life script, respectability was connected to control and containment. As a young married woman, she often recalled that her first husband physically abused her because she wanted more than to be at home cooking and cleaning and being a wife, uh, to be cut off from friends, family, and social worlds that she craved being a part of. As a domestic abuse survivor, she learned the first principle of confronting the power of abuse, right? And so power was always something that she would talk about in her interviews, right? This goes back to why she always used this word, word haters all the time, right? Haters were people that sort of came for you, right? And, and that was, uh, for her, really overcoming silence and speaking out about that which should never go unspoken. Um, this is important when we comprehend Jenny DeVetta's loud mouth, right, or how she was really came to sort of represent this kind of really brazen femininity. Um, and her loud mouth was often, right, about speaking out about, uh, about sex, right, her sex life, about marriage failures, about folks who, who did her wrong. Um, in other words, shame and silence had power over her throughout her young life. And so I think it requires a reconsideration of Jenny's sort of public displays or what were often perceived as these permanent uh, personal failures and flaws, right? Uh, that very much were dismissed by media as entertainment value, right? She just wants attention, et cetera, right? Uh, by extension, um, I, I think that the Jota and Jenny, right, um, through the afterlife, right, since her passing, the afterlife of, of Chacalosas and Malandrinas that are still out there, uh, continue to encourage Mexicana and Latina disidentification with neoliberalisms feminine performances of normative Latina citizenship. Uh, so for example, Jessica Quintana, executive director of Centro, a nonprofit Latino social service agency um, in Long Beach reminds us that Jenny's constituents related to her because she talked about her life in a very open way and really cared about issues that affected women like poverty, domestic violence, and independence. Rivera's gender performance then uh, was a powerful representation for gender queer Latinas who recognize the meaning um, and performance of acting out, right? Literally and figuratively to renounce, even if merely for the length of a song um, or one concert, they're, you know, to, to defy their representation as complacent, exploited, laboring subjects, right? That simultaneously are only legible as alien threats to Americanness. To be sure, Rivera's Malandrinas still give life to brown queer worlds, I believe, right? through sonic sociality scripts that dissent to the invisible, deferential, and perpetual marginal Mexicana subjectivities that are only necessary to, in order to actualize U.S. state-sanctioned discourses of white supremacist normativity. Rivera's Malandrinas represent Latinidad that does, doesn't know its neoliberal place, that seek fun and immediate gratification over neoliberal fabrications of security and protection that c cannot ever fully be trusted. Malandrinas are those family, familia, that we recognize but don't know what to do with. The ones who speak too loud, break the rules, linger too late, too much in your home, and perform antics that we are in fear of wanting to replicate ourselves. <laughs> and yet we need these queer gender performances in Latina cultural politics because they continue to push against normative boundaries of civility and respectability that justify social injustices of race, gender, and sexual violence. Um, in this way, we can also understand malandrinas in their non-musical form, right? So as an example, um, you know, of where las malandrinas sort of have, have been given life, right? 
Um, Jenny said Gutierrez, right, uh, who acted out at last year's White House Pride Parade. If you don't know, J-E-N-N-I-C-E-T, Gutierrez, Google the video, you can see it. Um, ever outburst during President Obama's welcome remarks uh, to celebrate uh, Pride Month, uh, basically shouting out critiques of Obama's policies around detention centers and immigration policies, uh, was met by the mostly white, lesbian, and gay White House administration and, and national LGBTQ leaders who had come, you know, from different organizations to celebration with boos and, and trying to shut down her voice, right? It was a really, really powerful kind of like display of this kind of idea of acting out and not knowing your place, right? And a lot of it was that Jenny said represented a kind of embarrassment, right, uh, to the collective. Um, this, this J or Jota and Jenny said, coincidentally, Jenny said with a J, reminded us, right, that the notion of respectability is key to the maintenance of empire. And this really played itself out during that that reception. Um, my scholarly interest has always been in asking social, cultural, and historical questions of difference in power, especially pertaining to gender and sexuality with attention to cultural productions by and about women of color performers. And this is because as much as um, I believe the potential of popular performance never exists outside of capitalist driven goals, right, to create commodities out of structural difference, I still believe there's always some potential for how popular performers represent other sonic imaginaries and scripts of sexual and gendered empowerment, desire, and agency. And, you know, in, in Latino, you know, musical history, we could point to Selena, Celia Cruz, most recently the passing of Juan Gabriel, right? Um, and and the, the meaning, the very powerful meaning that these um, singers have had, right, for a variety of reasons on, on their public. Um, so we can understand Jenny Rivera's music for ways the way social justice organizer Michelle Gonzalez Maldonado has described, right, um, as a platform for populations who are voiceless within dominant discourse, then we may appreciate how Jenny Rivera's musical embodiment of La Malandrina, or, or what I read as a Jota and Jenny, is a persistent reminder of the radical po possibilities such performances represent in defiance of neoliberal Latina citizenship. I believe the Jota and Jenny remains a powerful sonic portal even in her afterlife. Her musical performances still circulate and Las Malandrinas remain in cultural rotation, um, requiring us to ponder other models, other platforms and imaginaries that not only dissent to this kind of politics of respectability, uh, but in the spirit of Rivera's irreverent femininity, and this is what I think partly Jenny Set Gutierrez's performance does, right, that boldly and creatively call out right, or in Jenny's words, put on blast acts of economic injustice, um, racist xenophobia, and gender violence. So I'll end there. Thank you. I'm looking at the time, and I don't want us to go over this next scheduled event. So. Yes, but we can steal a few minutes uh, if you want to from the break before the concert, uh, which is only upstairs, so there's a very short walk, um, for some questions and discussion, comment. Please. Anything, I'm happy to translate anything that you saw. Great, Deb, thank you so much for this paper. I have one translation question. Um, a license plate with La Chaca. Yeah, uh, Chacalosa was the other really uh, popular song okay. that came out a little bit before this. So Chacalosa equally is a kind of vernacular for uh, a kind of narcotraficante kind of like gender figure, right? So they would call themselves Las Chacas or Chacalosa. And in fact, the song, um, I'm not sure you can't really hear it unless you're really listening for but she's calling out to the Chacalosas and Malandinas before she begins the lyrics to, to that song. And is it usually a masculine? No, these, like are, these are feminine form. gender. Like Chaca is yeah. no, it's usually yeah. feminine gender. Yeah, 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 Chacalosa. So I just commented about the video, and maybe you can talk a little bit about a, a video with no men, mm -hmm. or it, no, other than the other guy. Other than the brother. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the guy at the store, but it, this is about a group of women, and they're, they're not talking about men either. Mm -hmm. from what I can mm -hmm. gather. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could just speak about that and yeah. in contrast to typical representations of femininity in these videos. Yeah, no, actually, you know, in the longer um, piece that I'm writing on this, um, there's a lot of that kind of close 
reading that I'm pulling out, but you're absolutely right. Um, you know, kind of homosocial kind of environment. Um, the fact that also, you know, Rivera's career as a ranchera singer, right, uh, it's very few, right, that, and especially in that particular moment where banda music is, is so huge. It's mostly all male groups, right, all male singers. Uh, but in terms of the, you know, the, 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 the sort of narrative that's playing itself out in the song, you know, it is only one, but she's also sort of like um, playing with certain kinds of very popular, almost uh, masculine kinds of phrases, right? So she's saying, for example, nos damos gusto al gusto, right? It's a very masculine kind of like manchera, um, kind of musical phrase, but most often associated with most masculinity. We know how to give life, good life to life, right? Uh, and her references sort of like to drinking, um, also, the, the, the class critique, right, is really important, right, because ranchero music, of course, for anybody even knows a little bit, right, it's very much counter to the urban kind of cosmopolitan, right, we're really talking about, um, you know, working class, rural kind of labor subjects that the mostly have been shaped by masculinity, right, so even her kind of reference in the song lyrics to, you know, this kind of word ranchera kind of like figures, right, is, is pointing to and kind of playing with um, you know, counter to the rural ranchero figure being this kind of rural masculine figure, hardworking, right? So yeah, there's a lot of that going on. But yes, absolutely. Uh, the fact that there aren't any men, and there's this kind of like, you know, I read it as sort of like this s and sort of like play going on with sort of kidnapping these young women and trying to, in many ways, right, the song is, you know, the video's trying to, at least one, you know, one reading is they're trying to really, um, you know, help or assist in a particular way these women to teach them how to have fun, right? So in some ways, right, if you kind of read these folkies as this, this kind of representation of like middle class, uh, appropriate Mexican femininity, right? The other, the other term that's used a lot is fresa, strawberry in Mexican vernacular, right? To kind of like distinguish, right? It's sort of like, is a kind of critique of this sort of like performance, right? And she says in the song, the lyrics, right? You don't know how to have fun, and you're also afraid, you're very afraid of doing things, and we're not, right? So there's that kind of you know, thing going on too, yeah. yeah. so much. I also wondered if we could talk a little bit, it seems to me like there's something going on even more with the Junta, because in the name Jenny and in a lot of Hispanic names that begin with J, it doesn't behave in the language the way it's supposed to. Mm -hmm. Like in English, it, 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 it becomes almost palatized. It's like, it's like Jenny, and it's, not just, it's not a part just sound. Mm -hmm. But it's not hanging either. Yeah. It's not an like aspirated <laughs> consonant in yeah. Spanish. So it's kind of the consonant or the, the letter itself seems to misbehave mm -hmm. in any context. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that was. Yeah, and you know, that misbehavior very much is, you know, what we would call it kind of borderlands theory, right? It's, it's precisely yeah. that, which yeah. is that, you know, it's, it's not, it's, it's neither kind of like a, a formalized Mexican kind of like. Um, language, right, and neither U.S. English, right. So the fact that she always pronounced her name Jenny and not Kenny, right, exactly. The same thing with Selena, right. Selena was never Selena; she was Selena, right. So some of that is also about Jenny herself being a kind of borderlands subject, right. Like um, very much, you know, her her cultural sensibility, her a lot of what shapes Jenny is. is you know, this kind of immigrant sort of like cultural sensibility, but she's not herself. She's a formal U.S. citizen, right? Uh, but yet, you know, this also speaks to the kind of environment. She was surrounded, you know, in that moment. It's, it's this sort of like uh, convergence of what's happening in Los Angeles and Southern California, right? This massive influx, right, of, of recent, recently arrived, right? Because they've always arrived, Mexicanos, uh, with this boom in banda music, right? Uh, that really, um, in some ways, allowed for a connection between the children of these immigrants, right, to sort of have a kind of musical language with, with, their, with their parents, right? And so Jenny, even her kind of like desire, right, to sing ranchera music, you know, a lot of it was also because, you know, in her interview she talks about wanting to follow these kind of Mexican icons like Lucha Villa and others, right, because she had learned through her parents, right, how meaningful they were, but it, you know, I would call it that. So she's, she's straddling two realities, two cultures, two kind of national realities, right? So, yeah. Thank you. But also, just want to thank you for the new paper. Um, I wanted to go to uh, comments upon the scene where they take the middle class woman and put her 
in the trunk of the car. <laughs> um, because thinking about SNL play is so necessary for that to happen. But the way that I saw the way I interpreted that scene is that SNM play can also serve as a way of exploring parts of the self that are um, I don't want to say scary, but maybe um, inaccessible mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. everyday living experience. And so the way I saw it is like Jenny is almost like creating a scene with them where they can explore their inner mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Kota unit <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. self. Yeah. Um, and seeing it not because it's looking at some isn't isn't just the act itself. It's, mm -hmm, like it's mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm, it's the mm -hmm. exchange of power, the loss of power, gaining of power, you know, through consent, of course. Um, and so, I guess I don't really have a question, but I just think it's really interesting to think about the thinking about power dynamics not only in S and M play but also in um, uh, respectability politics, mm -hmm, politics mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm, imperialism, mm -hmm. neoliberalism. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Neoliberalism, neo ah, neo Liberalism, whatever, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, so I just thought that was really striking. Yeah, it was. And you know, and, and also, I mean, the other, the other commentary, the other read, right, one could have um, is that, that there is some kind of violence going on there, right? And, and, and I think that that's also productive too, right? Because I think, you know, um, you know this idea of, of sort of, be, you know, behaving badly or sort of behaving against, right, this, these expectations. I mean, that is also the reality, right? It's the kind of commentary, too, that, like, you know, not, not all, you know, not all uh, Mexicanos, right, are, are, you know, are civil or moral or have high character, right? That there, there are also these kinds of criminal aspects, right? But, and that's, that's okay, too, right? That those are also, right, um, not figures that, uh, that we need to also kind of, you know, hide or, or not admit to or, or whatever, right? So there's so some of that too that like, even if you read that is, is you know, and maybe I'm being too generous, kind of like thinking about this as SNM play, but only because of the, you know, the play factor, the, the smiles and the kind of, right? I mean, that's just one read, but the other read could just be that, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're really acting kind of violent and mean or, or what have you. But even if, if you read it along those lines, I think there's still a commentary that, you know, um, especially as, as a woman singer in that particular moment, you know, it's also important to sing about the kinds of subjects, um, criminality or otherwise, right, that also exist in our communities, right? Um, so, I mean, I think there's a number of ways, right, um, you know, to read that, right? Uh, call it aggressive or, or what have you, you know. Um, Another reading of that same thing is, is sort of like the worst nightmare of mm -hmm. the white Americans mm -hmm. who dread. Sure. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. Yeah. That they're not going to assimilate, but in fact, going to do the opposite. Kind right. Of like even the good people are going to get sucked into this, yeah. uh, this uh, yeah. bad behavior through the contagion of the the um, the presence yeah. of these bad. Yeah. 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 No, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of like. Uh, you said it much better than I just did, but yeah, I think that that's actually also partly could be argued what's happening there too, right? And I think, you know, Jenny, you know, emerges in that context. I mean, it's post 80s, early 90s, right? Um, and I think that that's why, you know, I took probably more time than I had to, but it's because it's really important to kind of like lay out some of her, her upbringing, her context, but um, yeah, and I think this is why fans, you know, even to this day, adored her, you know, because I think that Jenny, in, in a lot of ways, her performances allowed them not to be this kind of either, you know, deferential, persistent, kind of like nameless, laboring body, right, that, you know, is only, the, only, the only way to make, you know, make one legible, or, right, as the, as the kind of criminal, et cetera, right? There, there's something, and I think that particularly for Mexicanas, for, for Latinas, right, and documented especially, there's something really powerful, not that it's like pure of its problematics, but something really powerful about having a very aggressive kind of brazen performance of gender, right? Especially for Mexican, you know, public culture, right? That was counter to this kind of like bompis or very well behaved, you know, um, yeah, figures, right? Media figures and, and otherwise. There's something very um, powerful about that. and. I'm, I'm trying to figure that out, you know, so.